Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try to talk a bit about what to do with a, a patient being evaluated for anti-reflux surgery um, who has esophageal dysmotility, and I think it's something that uh, perplexes myself and, and a lot of us. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures, um, not relevant at all uh, to this talk. So I'm going to start with a, a patient I saw a few months ago in clinic. He was uh, 50 years old. He had long-standing heartburn. He was fairly well controlled with the PPI, but his main symptom was regurgitation. He slept upright in a recliner, um, couldn't bend over without regurgitating. Um, he had no dysphagia. Uh, EGD and upper GI demonstrated uh, five centimeter of sliding hiatal hernia, no esophagitis on PPI, and then he had uh, markedly abnormal acid exposure on uh, 24 hour pH off uh, PPI. He underwent high, high resolution manometry, which showed normal EG junction relaxation, then a standard uh, swallow um, uh, protocol that showed uh, eight weak swallows and two failed with a, a fairly low DCI. Uh, he was labeled as having an effect of esophageal dysmotility. So just a show of hands, uh, who in the audience would uh, recommend a Nissen fund application for this patient? And how about uh, a partial to pay fund application? All right, well, let's see. Well, I'll reveal at the end what I did. <laughs> so first question, you know, I, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble. Um, the patient had no dysphagia. Why, why did I even get a manometry at all? You know, is this really necessary? Um, and I, I would say yes. Um, every patient undergoing primary anti-reflux surgery should have a preoperative manometry, and for a few reasons. One, you need to exclude a primary esophageal motility disorder. Um, the, the symptom profile, while distinct, is, is not completely uh, uh, dichotomous. Next, you have to establish a baseline uh, in case the patient has problems postoperatively that allow you to diagnose what is causing the postoperative dysphagia. Um, and then third, which I'll, I'll talk about, is, is whether or not you're going to tailor uh, the fund application to that uh, manometry. So just some definitions. You know, how, what is ineffective esophageal motility? With con conventional manometry, this was defined by the amplitude of, of the peristaltic wave in the distal esophageal uh, sensors. Um, then when we switched over in the last 10 years to high-resolution manometry, um, th that definition has changed. So it's important to understand what you're talking about and what, what these reports mean. So the first two Chicago classification um, uh, protocols defined um, this as contractile breaks. So there was a gap in the peristaltic wave uh, as it propagated forward. Now, that was completely redone in the third uh, version, uh, which came out in 2015. So most reports that you get will probably use this version three. Um, and instead of using um, the, uh, these breaks, it was really the, the force or the contractile integral summing of, of the, uh, the pressure over time uh, and space um, that replaced it. And this was found to better correlate with dysphagia than the old contractile breaks. And of note, this is actually going back more to how conventional manometry uh, evaluated peristalsis. So uh, the protocol is to do a series of 10 5 milliliter water swallows in the supine position, and then each swallow is graded uh, on how strong the DCI is. Uh, less than 100 is a failed swallow, 100, uh, that should be 100 to one, uh, 450 is a weak swallow, and uh, over 8,000 is a hypercontractile. Anything before, between 450 and 8,000 is considered normal. A patient is labeled as having ineffective esophageal motility if half the swallows are failed or weak. Um, and then absent contractility is if 100% of swallows are failed. And I would say this is a major disorder of esophageal motility, so those patients are very different and very complicated. Uh, for today, I'm just going to uh, uh, focus on these uh, IEM patients. Um, and this is a very common, it's a secondary uh, or minor diagnosis of uh, dysmotility. So then you get this report, and you know the way I think about it is you need to have a sort of conceptual framework for approaching how uh, uh, you approach these patients. And I, I always go back to and focus on what, what are we trying to achieve with the operation itself. And these are operations that are trying to achieve uh, improvement in the patient's symptoms and their quality of life. Um, so that really comes in two parts. The first is the operation has to eliminate uh, gastroesophageal reflux. That's how it improves the patient's symptoms. But a second important point is that it has to avoid functional complications, namely dysphagia and gas bloat. You don't want to introduce uh, symptoms. So it's pretty simple. You have to choose a wrap that maximizes, number one, elimination of GERD, while minimizing number two. 
So then, you know, the way I think about it is how we, do we compare Nissan? And I'm going to focus on Toupee. Um, don't really have time to get into it, but I think there's good evidence that Toupee is superior to door in reflux control. Um, so focusing on Nissan versus Toupee, how do they uh, compare in terms of elimination of reflux? avoiding functional complications, and then how do they compare in the specific context of patients who have IEM? So first, uh, elimination of reflux. So there have been eight, uh, uh, now nine randomized trials comparing this and, and Toupee. Um, and overall, there, there were no differences um, uh, when you combine these trials in uh, elimination of reflux on a 24-hour pH study and no difference is in the patient's symptom profiles in terms of heartburn regurgitation symptoms. Um, it was alluded to previously, the, this uh, randomized trial out of Sweden that was published this year, I think uh, excellent trial, the largest randomized trial comparing fundification types. And again, at five years, no differences in reflux symptoms and no differences in PPI use. And here you see the, the pH studies, uh, nor excellent reflux control with both Nissen and Toupee uh, normalized in both groups, no differences at three years. However, there is some uh, case series evidence, uh, comparative trials um, out of several, and I, I would note that these are United States uh, centers, um, that there, there may be long-term recurrence uh, that's more prevalent after toupee. Um, and you know, could that be related to a U.S. diet, uh, a greater BMI in, in these patients? Um, it's unclear, but, but that's something to keep in mind. So how do the two operations compare in terms of avoiding functional complications? I think something that's really important. Um, the same meta-analysis showed that overall um, there were higher rates of dysphagia uh, with the Nissen. However, those rates uh, uh, decreased over time. Um, there were uh, patients needed more dilations uh, after Nissen, uh, and then and Nissen had more both uh, gas bloat and inability to belch uh, than toupee. Uh, this most recent Swedish trial had uh, similar results, and you see that there was more dysphagia early on in the first two years, uh, but this, uh, they were equal at three years. Uh, so it seems over time that that difference uh, normalized. And I should say that significant quality of life impacting dysphagia was rare after both operations. So how about in the specific context of patients with IEM? Um, there's been two randomized trials that tried to address this issue. Both were done with con conventional manometry, um, and they first segregated patients um, into uh, ineffective motility and normal motility, and then within each group, uh, they randomized them to either Nissen or Toupee. Uh, the first had 100 uh, of each groups um, and showed that post-op dysphagia was more common after than, uh, Nissen than after Toupee, and this was true in, in both groups, both the normal motility and the IEM groups. And here's the patients with IEM. You can see the darker gray are the patients with dysphagia, uh, and they had uh, equal uh, dysphagia before, but more patients had dysphagia after Nissen than Toupee. However, interestingly, there was no difference in the rate of dysphagia between the patients with normal motility and those with IEM. So Nissen was worse in both groups, but the two groups were equivalent. The other randomized trial actually had pretty several results. Overall, dysphagia was more common after Nissen than Toupee, uh, and there was no difference in dysphagia between the IEM and normal groups. So both papers concluded against a tailoring approach. So you, you should not tailor based on uh, uh, the, the IEM. Uh, sort of saying that IEM, as based on conventional manometry, is not a good predictor of post-operative dysphagia. However, I, I found it interesting in rereading these papers that neither one uh, advocated for doing a toupee in everyone. So they were sort of very explicit about their conclusion against tailoring, but not so explicit in their conclusion about which uh, was superior. Um, so how about translating? Th those were conventional manometry studies. How do we translate that into high-resolution manometry? Um, there have been some uh, uh, predictive series, so looking back at, at sort of using the, these results to predict post-operative dysphagia, uh, one out of uh, the Portland group, um, suggesting that a, a lower DCI, um, and interestingly, that, that's a pretty high DCI, uh, was uh, associated with dysphagia after Nissen. Uh, another group uh, showed that there was an in inverse linear correlation between DCI and post-op dysphagia. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, something that's been used more recently is a mul multiple rapid swallow protocol and the augmentation on multiple rapid swallows uh, as compared to the non-augmented DCI uh, prote seem protective against post-duct dysphagia. So in summary, I think uh, I, I would advocate that, that high resolution manometry should be re performed routinely uh, preoperatively. Um, IEM is associated with preop dysphagia, um, and I think it may predict uh, post-op dysphagia, but, but more work needs to be done about that. Uh, Nissen and Toupee fundiplication result in similar uh, GERD control um, physiologically, uh, as been demonstrated in randomized trials, but Nissen may be more durable, especially in U.S. populations. Nissen definitely results in more post-op dysphagia, uh, irrespective of manometry findings. However, um, new onset long-term dysphagia is rare, and most patients with dysphagia improve after either operation. Um, and I would say there's no level one evidence that a tailing approach uh, uh, improves outcomes. So then I'm going to give you my conclusions. So these are all supported by evidence. And I'm going to give you three uh, conclusions that directly contradict one another. <laughs> so the first is that Nissen fundiplication uh, may be superior to toupee for long-term control of GERD, and it results in rare long-term dysphagia. There's no direct evidence uh, supporting a tailored approach. Therefore, Nissen should be the preferred operation for GERD, regardless of preoperative high-resolution manometry um, findings. That's supported by the evidence. Number two, while Nissen may be superior for long-term control, it also re results in higher rates of dysphagia. IEM is definitely associated with both pre- and post-op dysphagia, and so therefore patients with IEM should be tailored and undergo toupee, while those with normal motility uh, should undergo Nissen. That's definitely supported by the evidence. <laughs> Number three, there's level one evidence that supports the equivalence of toupee and Nissen in terms of GERD control. While Nissen definitely, uh, according to level one evidence, results in more post-op dysphagia and gas bloat. Therefore, toupee should be the preferred approach regardless of high-resolution manometry photo. That conclusion is supported by the evidence. So back to the patient. Um, I won't give away all my thinking on this, but I did a uh, toupee fund application. Thank you. <laughs>